So today we're here to talk a little bit about change. Back in 2008, I think most people recall seeing change we can believe in. Change was front and center during the presidential election campaign. It was everywhere, you couldn't deny it. And the country was getting really excited about change. So change was just, as my sister said, something that you couldn't escape. And we bring this up, though 2008 might seem like a long time ago, because it was a really inspiring election season for us. Everyone was filled with a new sense of hope. But what is change really when you fundamentally start to think about it and break down the definition of the word? So change in one sense is to become different. Change is also to make something or someone different. And change is to transform, to become something else. But the kind of change that we're gonna dig into tonight is the kind that gives a person or a place or a neighborhood a different position or a course or direction. Our story of change begins in one Philadelphia neighborhood, Germantown. Germantown is in the northwest section of Philadelphia, and we're gonna take you all the way down to southwest Germantown, which is just about a mile away from here. And even smaller than that, we're gonna take you to Rockland Street. It's one residential block, it's the unit block, between Green Street and Germantown Avenue. We live on Rockland Street. There's 46 houses, there are three stories, five bedrooms, they're row houses, and they're about 100 years old. Our block is diverse. There's homeowners, there's renters, there's apartments, there's rooming houses, there's subsidized houses. Everybody lives on our block. We even have a school, the DePaul Catholic School. We have a vacant church. It was formerly St. Francis of Assisi, and it closed down and there's nothing there right now. We also have six vacant lots. On one of those lots, there's a community garden. Our block, if you really break it down to the 46 houses, to the different makeups and residences, residents, sorry, to the different makeup and demographics of our residents, really combined um, create the perfect place to experiment, which is really how we got started with our project, which we like to just call the West Rockland Street Project. So the West Rockland Street Project is a grassroots initiative that my sister and I started in 2009 during the foreclosure crisis. And the aim of the project is really to concentrate all our efforts on revitalizing just one city block and see what the community that we, our neighbors and ourselves can do to change its future. And that's through community organizing, um, small-scale urban interventions, with do-it-yourself spirit, and a low-cost, high-impact approach. The fundamental um, drive of our project is to create change you can see. So what you're seeing right now are two vacant properties on the edge of our block. This is the corner of Rockland Street and Green Street. They had fire at some point, and what was there were shells of houses. They were wide open. People could get inside, raccoons. They were filled with graffiti and dumping. This here is, the, is a vacant lot right next door, and this is where the house completely burned down. And when, when you look at that picture, um, you'll see a lot of plastic bags. In all of those plastic bags was dog dew. So someone was walking their dog, and then they had a bag, but every bag went into the lot. It's you not a pretty sight. And this is an image from Google Earth, which if you ask me if someone's looking up directions to get to my house, I would hate for them to see this. So we decided to do something about it. When you're facing problems 
as big as these when you're talking about vacant homes that have been there for 20 plus years, a vacant lot that's owned by the city that has been left to languish and be dumped in and mistreated. Um, you might just want to throw your hands up and really not do anything, which is what people did for about 20 years. But our answer to that is a bit different. We feel like anybody, even your just average citizen, which we consider ourselves to be, can be the solution. And so we're gonna talk about how. How can you make this step and really get more involved in your community? It's actually pretty easy, the first step that is. Yep, so the first step usually doesn't cost anything. Clean up. Um, we all want someone else to do it for us, but that's not always the case. There's lots of programs out there where you can get help cleaning up. We, our first attempt at cleaning up was the Philly Spring Cleanup in 2009. That's when we first stepped into the poop lot and <laughs> no one wanted to go in. I went in first to start getting at least the poop bags out. People were too disgusted. And we had Drexel students and people from the block and that was our first step. And you can see everyone pitches in. That's a city trash truck back there in the corner. And you know, they're probably not supposed to let us do this, but we had so much trash that we had pulled out of this lot. We were helping load the truck. You can connect with groups. Um, when the church was still there, we connected with a group of students. I'm pretty sure the students you see there are from St. John's. They came down for the day for Philly Spring Cleanup. Um, it was a great day of cleaning up with neighbors and people who weren't from the neighborhood as well. And St. John's, by the way, is based in New York City. We've had student groups come from five different states all the way to volunteer on just one city block. Those efforts really paid off. Um, at, when this picture was taken, you can see that the vacant houses were still there, but the lot looked a lot better. And so every day now the people coming and going from West Rockland Street weren't greeted with that same sorry sight. They saw something different. And this is the kind of change that we think is really, really important because there's so many um, big issues in the city that we're facing. And sometimes it's nice to just know that you can put a little elbow grease in and make a impact pretty much instantaneously. So one thing that's really important when you're starting to get the work in your neighborhood or on your block is telling your story. Not only do you want to do the work, you want to talk about it and document it and let people know what's happening. So I'm pretty sure the folks at Penn Charter know about our project from this website. So this is a blog that we started to document our project starting back in 2009. We don't always post as regularly as we should, but we try to make sure that we capture all of our biggest projects. And the reason for doing this is it's sort of an online diary of our efforts, but at the same time, it's the type of resource that has helped connect us with other neighbors around the city. So we've made friends in Hawthorne and in Huntington Park and in West Philadelphia, people who are coming from similar environments who want to trade tips and resources. We've also connected with um, former residents of the block. When there's been stories in the news, we usually always get a couple emails from residents that had lived on West Rockland Street in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, which is really, really exciting to see, and we share as many of those as we can on, the, on our website. The other thing um, that is a byproduct of sharing your story is getting important media coverage that can really aid in your efforts to transform your neighborhood. So for example, this story here was, I think it was in the Philadelphia Inquirer and it was on the front page of philly.com, the website. And this came about after my sister, she started a greening project called Grow This Block. It's an annual block-wide planting project. And there was a great story in the Sunday Philadelphia Inquirer that the mayor happened to read. And on his way to the gym, he decided to just stop by West Rockland Street to see what was going on. 
So I get this call from my sister that's like, the mayor is on the block. Um, I was at the beach. I like jumped town. So I said, deal with it. So she takes the mayor on a tour of the block and he asks, oh, I forgot to click. <laughs> he asks, well, well, what's going on here? What do you guys need help with? And she marched him right down to the bottom of the block and showed him those vacant houses. And it didn't take long before something was actually done about it. So okay. yeah, there's So there's Nutter. Mayor Nutter and everyone was exhausted after the big planting day the day before. And I was in the backyard still moving plants around and stuff like that. And someone banged on the door. He's here, came out. He was meeting everybody. People were excited. And that's what we did. We took him down to the houses and we said, what is this? You know, um, houses aren't supposed to look like that. It's been a blight on the community. It had, those houses had been there for, we think, about 20 years in that condition, and they had never even been sealed by licensing and inspections. And it shows how the mayor can cut red tape because it was only a few days before these signs went up on the building, warning that they, you know, they were imminently dangerous, they could fall at any point. And within a few days, we saw contractors down there bidding on the job. The job was awarded, and all of a sudden, the, the heavy machinery came in to tear down the buildings. I'm gonna go back, actually, because these pictures are pretty remarkable, I think. Especially if you were a longtime resident of this neighborhood and you saw those houses in, those condi in that condition for so long, this was an incredible sight to see. So another important thing um, that you can do is also seems really simple, and it's what we talked about, putting that elbow grease in. Um, the, the slide said you can sweat. Uh, so what were we left with when the houses were torn down? It was like very, very exciting for a moment. And then this was it. It was like the sudden sand lot. And you're, you kind of have to wonder, well, oh, this is wonderful, but what happens next? Well, we can tell you nothing happens next. There is no plan. You're not getting a fence. No one's going to plant grass. This is it. And this is what it's like for a lot of people living um, among vacant properties in the city. You might um, have seen the vacant lots that have grass and like a nice little picket fence. Those are lots that are part of a land care program, but unfortunately only a small percentage of the city's vacant properties are actually part of that program. The rest languish like the lot on our block did. So we had to beg, borrow, and steal pretty much to get a fence installed, and we did get some help from the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society with that. We also, um, because it was sand, we were gonna need to dump like pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds of dirt in the lot to grow grass. So we ended up sort of taking the route of grass kind of eventually growing naturally, which it does in about a year and a half. So first we put down some mulch because Somebody at Parks said that they would drop it off for us. So we were like, we'll take it. Look at how much better it looks. And our idea was to just make this space a safe place that kids could run around, the people could hold events in, the people could play. So you'll see that this is one of our young neighbors, Kevon. He's a part of tons of things we do on the block with his paper airplane. And you can see there the grass is starting to come in. That's kind of what the lot looked like this past summer. That's the kind of fence you'll see around the city that is part of the land care program with PHS. Our, with that program, the lots are regularly maintained. Our lot is not a part of that, but they did get us the fence. So once we had this like nicer, cleaner, safer place to be, we thought it would be automatic that people would just start using it, but it turns out people had been with it for so long and that other condition a lot of people on our block just walked right by it and weren't really using it. So we started hosting our block meetings and other events at the vacant lot to get people to use it and to introduce it as a public space that people could use. And that worked really, really well. Um, at first, when we would put, oh, we're gonna have the flea market at the corner at the vacant lot, people were like, why are we having it down there? It's crazy down there. But obviously it's not. And that really, marked a turn once people started using the space. 
we held a Halloween event um, last year, which was really, really, really fun. And after that, people wanted to, well, they were asking me if they could have barbecues and birthday parties. And I'm like, we don't own it. Um, so long as you clean up, <laughs> enjoy it. Uh, we had bobbing for apples, face painting, everything. And this is all stuff that people who live on our block volunteered um, to do for the kids. A couple more pictures. So this here is Mark. He is um, one of my mother's former students and he spent a lot of time volunteering on our block. And I show this picture because I also just love that someone can sit here and have a calm moment and reflect and maybe think about whatever might be on their mind. Um, and this is a great, now a great new addition to our community. So I think how we went about this project is really the fundamental message that we're trying to share tonight, which is you can really be the change. It's not just a change that we can believe in or hope that we want to feel or that we're looking for. You can actually be the change and it's not that hard. So we're gonna leave you with nine rules that you could use in your own community or on your own block. One, number one, persistence overcomes resistance. So that's just kind of talking about how you have to keep trying, especially in the city of Philadelphia. Beat the bushes. There you'll see some of our flyers. We put out flyers for everything. Some people ask today, why do you have flyers? Can't you do it on Facebook or email? Everyone is not using a computer. So the good old fashioned flyers, posters, there's a poster for Philly Spring Cleanup, door knocking, telling your neighbor who tells their neighbor is really important. It actually turns out that um, very few of our block residents actually use, excuse me, use our website. It's mostly city agencies, other organizers in other neighborhoods around the city and people from far beyond Philadelphia who are discovering the website. Get a bullhorn and use it. So bullhorns, another old fashioned tool maybe, they work wonderfully. These are the kids reading off um, winners for a raffle prize at one of the events that we had. We've also used the bullhorns too, it's kind of funny. Um, but when we have the monthly clean, cleanups in the summertime, people have to move their cars. Kids love getting on the bullhorn and waking everybody up, getting people out the door and going. So kids, kids are really important. Um, I, I wanna say every block has kids, but that may not be true, but our block has a lot of kids and they want to do stuff. They wanna be engaged. They want to work with you. They wanna learn. So if there's kids out there, you have to pull them into the fold. I think the other thing I'll mention about the kids before we pick back up with the slideshow um, is uh, the, the picture that was showing was kids who had planted what is what we call a sidewalk garden, which is in an empty tree pit. Um, so a funny story is Anya also runs the tree tenders group in the neighborhood and has been trying to get more people to plant new street trees. but. Our block is in an older part of town and so the street trees that used to be there were not really equipped to be street trees. They were just enormous, enormous trees that um, are better suited for parks and wooded areas and whatnot. So people had some bad experiences with them, actually damaging pipes and breaking up the sidewalks and whatnot. So these sidewalk gardens are sort of our gateway into getting people to plant new trees. And later this summer or fall, um, a couple new yeah, street trees we'll are going We'll have our in. first few trees going back in. And that, that brings us to another point, is that examples are very important. So before you can convince everybody to do one thing, sometimes you have one or two people try it, 
other people see it and then they want to join in or buy into what it is. So number five, it might seem a bit obvious, but it's holding these regular meetings and talking and communicating with your neighbors. Because you actually, if you feel like you might not have that much in common, um, you do. Like Anya mentioned earlier on, our block is made up of such a range of people coming from all different backgrounds, and yet we've been able to come together on these common issues to improve the environment on our street. Embracing the power of plants is important. Occasionally, pe people we find people knocking greening or trees or community gardens, but it's not always about the garden, the plant, the seed, or what you're growing. It's about building community. So when people get to, together around planting, there's way more that can come from that. It's also a really low-cost way to make a big difference. Um, in, I mean, it really is the, the change you can see. And one of the byproducts of the greening projects that we've done on the street has actually been a like overwhelming reduction in litter because people have new gardens and sidewalk planters um, and are just much more engaged in public spaces on the street that I think that naturally our neighbors are taking more pride in where they live and kids are thinking more about it because they're also engaged in the activities and we were able to cut back on that. Um, litter is still like a crazy problem though. I would definitely not say that we've by any means combated the issue, um, but it's something that we're continuing to improve. So tell everyone, you want to make sure your success is spread all around your neighborhood and your block, also to city officials, your council people, city agencies, everyone needs to know how successful things are. It's just going to get more people involved in the movement. So number nine is, I think, a given if you're from Philadelphia, which is to throw a block party. And when we became co-block captains back in 2009, that was one of the first things that we wanted to bring back was the annual block party. And we like to do it pretty big. We usually have about 200 or so people come to um, our block parties every summer. This year, we have a um, sprinkler cap from the fire department, which makes it safe and lowers the volume of water for turning on the hydrants. It's something that the fire department gives out and is permissible in the city. What you're not supposed to do is just turn it on and let it However, flood. However, um, if you're looking at this slide, <laughs> this is the fire hydrant on full blast, which <laughs> is the most fun. And the wrench that you see there we went through this period of everyone looking for this wrench. There was no wrench. So finally someone got a wrench. I don't know where, the basement, something like that. And this is the very first day that the wrench was found and the water went on. And everyone was just like, whoa. Germantown, by the way, doesn't actually have a, um, a rec center with a public swimming pool. Um, students or kids can use the indoor pool, which is at the Pickett campus. Um, and the other closest nearby public pool uh, that's at a rec center is at Hunting Park. This is Anya in the dunk tank, <laughs> which is also a must have if you're gonna have a block party. So that is pretty much how you become what we refer to as a do-it-yourself citizen. And we think that People can really do this across the city in all different types of environments and blocks with all different types of neighbors coming from all different backgrounds. And if everyone was just doing a little bit more, we think that we ourselves could turn Philadelphia around. Okay.